So in this clip I'm going to go through uh, the regression analysis topic. I'll put a, just a little bit more detail on some things which I skimmed over in the lecture. Firstly, it's important that you know when we do regression analysis we have two types of variables. We have what we call a dependent variable and we have what we call explanatory variables. So that could be, let me make that clear, it could be one or several. Okay, that's why I write it this way. In generic form we often call this dependent variable y and we call the explanatory variable x. Okay, there could also be, if we have more variables, there could be others. Let's call them Z, M, however many we want. But we're going to abstract from these for the minute. Then, we have, as before, we will have observations. And for each observation we have, we will have a value for the dependent variable and for the explanatory variable. So that's why I'll put this little subscript here and I'll say our I will go from 1 to, let's say, n, where n is our sample size. So if we have 100 observations, then we will have 100 values for y and 100 values for x, and they belong to each other. For each observation, we have one particular value of y and one particular value of x. So, I mean, it's the first thing, when you have a regression analysis, you have to be clear about which variables you're interested in, and in particular, which of these is the dependent variable. And it should be changes in the explanatory variable that explain particular values for the dependent variable. So what we then do is we'll say, okay, we have what we call a population model. What do I mean with this? We'll say that, or we hypothesize that, really, there is going to be some functional relationship between our explanatory variable, the x, and our dependent variable. And let's say that this variable is, uh, this relationship is a linear relationship. And we know that linear relationships can be described by an intercept and by a slope parameter. So let me just do a little graphical representation here. Okay, so you know that if you have x here and y here, and usually you put the dependent variable on, on the vertical axis, if you have a linear relationship, let's do a negative, most often we do a positive, so here we'll do a negative, so if there's a linear relationship, then this can be described by the intercept, and here we call that alpha, and it can be described by a slope parameter that is determined by this angle here, and the slope we usually call beta, and that appears here. So, these guys, however, they are unknown. Okay, and that's why we call it the population model. It's like the population mean. Unless we have all the values of the population, we don't know it. So this relationship, yi and xi, described by this alpha and beta, this is unknown. Now, one more thing. If we thought that this relationship would be perfect, i.e., if we thought if you knew the value of x and the value of the intercept and the slope, then you could exactly predict what this the value of the dependent variable was, then this would be it. However, in uh, all reality we have to recognize that most of these relationship, economic or sociological relationships, somehow involve, you know, some human in the end. And humans don't behave according to rules. So usually this these two things, the right hand side and the left hand side, are actually not equal. To make it equal, now let me undo this unequal sign, what we do is we'll put another term here, okay, and we call this the error term.
and that makes allowance for you know humans not behaving according to rules so this relationship may not be perfect there's going to be some mismatch and we call that error term now in practice what we will see is well, in practice what we will have we will have a sample okay now let me do this in blue a sample actually of size n okay of size n so we have n observations now these points sample points if you were to put a scatter plot they will you know scatter somewhere here let me just make a quick and and dirty scatter plot so now you can see these points they have some sort of negative relationship but they cluster around around these uh, around this relationship. Now in the lecture we talked about the decomposition of the y with respect to this line of best fit. So firstly perhaps I should say since these parameters alpha and beta are unknown of course that means that also this line here is unknown. Okay, This red line here is unknown as well. So what we want is we have our sample observations and we want to use this sample information to find some line of best fit to these sample points. Now I could I'll just draw one in. Okay, perhaps the line of best fit to these sample points. How will we get that? Well we've learned in the lecture but I'll repeat it here. This sample line will not be the same as the population line. Okay, so from using the sample we will we will want the line of best fit. Now this we can get, okay, that's the blue guy here. This we can get but it will not be the same as the population model or the population line. So so far so good. I said we can get this line of best fit based on the sample, but now we'll discuss how we can get it. Okay, so this one line of best fit we can get this and the question is how okay and this is what we're gonna answer now what we need we need two things we need the intercept and we need the slope so it turns out that it is the slope which we're gonna take care of first and here's the formula which I'm gonna give you. Okay, the formula for the slope is gonna be b. Now, to make sure what b is, b is really the equivalent to the beta, but it's not the same. It is in fact an estimate for b. So sometimes you will read that we call b also beta hat, hat standing for the estimator for beta. But usually we call it just little b. Now, this is gonna be calculated as the covariance between y and x, and you know how to calculate covariances, divided by the variance of x. So as I said in the lecture, where this formula comes from, you don't have to worry about, you just have to accept it is there. If you're really keen to find out where it comes from, please do talk to me in my office hour and uh, we'll, I'll show you. All right, once we have that slope and we'll have an example then you can continue on to getting the intercept now this intercept we call a but again to indicate what it really is it is the equivalent of the alpha in the population model but it's not the same as the alpha it is in fact alpha hat an estimate for the alpha okay but that will be in general unequal to the alpha which is unknown so in this guy we calculate as y bar minus b, and that comes from here, from our first step, times x bar. And y bar and x bar are just average, sample averages for our dependent and our explanatory variable. So once we have this a and b, okay, these guys here, then we can write down our relationship. Okay, so now instead of alpha plus beta times xi, we get a plus 
plus b times xi. Now, but what is this? Now, this will be our sample line. That's going to be the blue line, despite this being green. But we need to recognize that this is not going to be the same as the actual observed value, because you can see any particular value, observed value, doesn't actually lie on that point. There is going to be a difference. And that difference is going to be something like the error term. But now the error term, we don't know the true error terms. Again, we have what we call estimates for the error term. So I call this little EI. Okay, and again, perhaps I should say that here as well. That is like an estimate for the i-th for the i error term. So in practice, let us just cl clearly point out what we what we have. Okay, so we have. I need to use a different color. It's not very pretty, but here it is. We have observations for y i and x i. Okay, and for each of them we have n. If we, once we have these values, we can calculate the covariance and the variance of x. That means we can get b. Once we have b and we have x bar and y bar from our sample information, we can calculate a. Once we have a and b, we can write down this relationship, but we need to recognize that to make this equal, this part here, this is the line of best fit. This represents the values on the line of best fit. To make this equality hold, we have to add this error term. And this error term, when we did that in the lecture, we decompose, sometimes going to be positive, sometimes going to be negative. Importantly, this bit here, that light blue bit, this is what we call y hat. This is the values on the line. on the line of best fit. And the rest is the yi and the ei. All right, so far so good. Now let us use an example, and we use the example from the lecture, the house prices. You have the Excel spreadsheet available to you, and here, here it is, and you can see there are all sorts of variables here. Um, how old it is, age, um, all sorts of stuff. You can uh, in the info spreadsheet you can see what all the values, all the variables are. We have 321 observations, so you can see 321 observations here. Let me actually freeze the top row so we can always see what the uh, variables are. So here we go. Now we know to calculate the slope what we need is covariance y and x, variance of x and y bar and x bar. So now firstly we need to decide what in our case is the y and what's the x. So we said our dependent variable is the price. So what I'll do here is I'll just put a y in here and the area that was our or that was the size in the lecture we called it the size that was our x variable okay so we called that p and that actually s in the lecture slide so let me just write this down so we'll go i have an example so firstly i said we need to know what's the dependent variable and what's the explanatory or independent variable. So the dependent variable was the price and we call that P and we have that for every i've observation and the size or in the spreadsheet it was called the area that was the explanatory variable and we called that SI in the lecture notes. Okay, and our i goes from 1 to 3 to 1, 321 observations we have. All right, so now in all we do is we'll replace yi with p, and p 
pi and xi with si. So it's very important that you're not only slavishly sticking to the y and x. This was just our generic form. And we'll just adjust that to our example. So to calculate the b, as I said before, we have the formula here. We now need, we need y bar, we need x bar, we need the covariance of yi and xi and we need the variance of xi. Once we have these values we can calculate the a and the b. So let's go let's go here let's just go to the bottom of the table. So we need the averages. Average of let's call them h2 to h322. That's the average. Let's do this average. And we need the variance. And in particular, we need the uh, sample variance. So call this variance and the variance sample for H2 to H322. That's our value. Now that's the variance for Y. Actually, we don't need that. We need the variance for X. So I just copy the formulas across. Um, here is the, uh, let's just make sure it does calculate the right thing. Okay, so that's the variance for x. And lastly, we need the covariance. Let me just write here covariance. So, covariance, or a sample covariance again, and that was of variables in H2 to H322 and the second series is J2 to J322. So these are the two series we need the covariance from. Well, um, what is it? Covariance dot S. What's that one? Here it is the covariance. So basically what we now need is these values. I could copy them across here by hand, but you have these values on your lecture slides anyway. So I'm not going to copy that by hand. I'm going to do the calculations here in Excel, and you could do it, of course, by calculator. We know to get B, so we are going to calculate A and B. To get B, what we need is the covariance between Y and X, and we divide this by the variance of X. 40.13764. So, unfortunately, that's the same as in the lecture. 41.3764. So, A and B, this was 40.13764. And then we can calculate A because that is, let's just check this with the formula here y bar minus b times x bar. So we have y bar, which is this one, the average value of y minus the calculated value of b times the average value of x. Here we go, 11541.53. So here we go, 11541.53. I think that was right. 541.53. That's it. So now we have our expected value. So how do we use this now? So how do we get predictions, for instance? So let's say we have a house that has, let's, let's see, actually uh, the size area. I just want to find out what sort of minimum and maximum values for that. So minimum of J2 to J322, 735 and the maximum is 51. So let's say we have a, have a house close to the maximum size. Let's say it has 5,000 square feet. So, a house with 5,000 square feet, so feet squared, 
area or size. So what is our predicted price? So P predicted for this. Well, what we're going to use now is basically this relationship here. Oop, that's what I wanted. So this relationship. This is what we're going to use. Okay, here it is a plus b times xi. Now, of course, our x, our ex explanatory variable is not x, but it is s for size. So, well, I have to say this is size i. So, our a is 11541.53. Now B is plus 40.13764 and now our particular size is this guy here, 5000. Okay, that's for the house we are interested in. So now we just need to calculate that. Actually, let's use Excel because I have the B and the A already. So if our house has a size of 5000, so we calculate a plus B times the 5,000, we get 212,229. 212,229.7, I think. So this would be, given our estimated relationship, this would be the predicted size of a house. Uh, sorry, the predicted price of a house. Two things. Firstly, we want, I want to talk about how well does our model fit the data. How well does our model fit the data? So I'll just give you two plots. Now we are going a little bit away again from our example. So this is generic. Actually, what I'll do is uh, yeah, we have a picture already, but it's overlaid with too much other stuff. So I'll draw two new pictures again. So we have data. I'll use a negative relationship again for no particular reason. So we have this one and we have another one which is equally a negative relationship. So, okay, let's fit lines of best fit in here. There's a red line. Um, so here possibly the line of best fit would look something like this and here it would look like this. If we were to just compare the lines of best fit, they look fairly similar. But which one fits better? Okay, so think about that for a few seconds. Which one fits the data better? Or in other words, in which of these two graphs do the data lie closer to the line of best fit? Okay, and that is clearly here the case. Okay, that is a closer, or we call it a better fit. So, what we're now going to think about is some sort of measure or a statistic that describes fit, describes or better the closeness of fit. And we would want that the measure for this example describes a better fit. Now this measure is what we call an R squared. Okay? And that will be between two values, between zero and one. Okay? Where zero is equivalent to I ah, actually let's start with one. One means perfect fit. Perfect fit. 
Okay, so that means all data points, all data points lie on the line of best fit. Line of best fit. Now zero, it's difficult to describe it in terms of relationship between the line of best fit and points, but basically we it, it will turn out that this is equivalent to saying there is no relationship. So now this should sound somewhat familiar. For instance, we have Remember, we talked about a correlation coefficient. A correlation coefficient. Now, a correlation coefficient could take values between negative 1. It could, of course, take a value of 0 as well, and up to positive 1. Now, what did these men values mean? This was a perfect positive relationship, negative 1 was a perfect negative relationship, and 0 meant no relationship. Now how do these two guys fit together? So it turns out that this 0, no relationship, is exactly the same as this in the correlation, no relationship. So if we find that x and y are uncorrelated, have a zero correlation, we will find, if we run a regression between these two, that we find the r squared to be equal to zero. On the other hand, if we have a va two variables that are perfectly negatively correlated or perfectly positively correlated in and if we were to run a regression between these two variables we will find that in both these cases the r squared is going to be equal to 1. So there seems to be some quite close relationship. Now it turns out that for a simple regression, oh actually in that video I haven't explained what a simple regression is, I'll go back to that in a minute a simple regression, it turns out that the r squared is the same as the correlation coefficient, and we call that little r, okay, I'll, say, I'll write it here as well, correlation coefficient, but not the correlation coefficient itself, but squared. Okay, so the r squared is the same as the correlation coefficient squared. And that means you already know how to calculate it, because you know the cor correlation coefficient was the covariance between y and x divided by the variance of x times the variance of y, but the square root of this, so the product of the two standard deviations. And now if that, what we have in parentheses now, that was the correlation coefficient, now we need to square it. Okay, and that's the value for uh, the r squared. Now, with a little bit of algebra, you know that this is nothing else but the covariance between y and x squared divided by the variance of x and the variance of y. So let me just come back to this issue of simple regression. I said at the very beginning, let me just go all the way up again, that we can have explanatory variables, we can have several ones. If we have only one, we call our regression analysis a simple regression. Okay, if you have only one, it's a simple regression. If you have more than one, 
let's say X's, Z's and M's, if I use little i's here, I should use little i's here as well, then we call it a multiple regression. Now we won't deal with this, um, but in the Excel example actually I will show you how to do it. So, now of course you already know how to calculate covariances and variances uh, either in a tabular form if I give you just a small number of data or in Excel that means really calculating this R squared shouldn't be much of an issue. But I want to go back to now is this issue of dif difference between population and sample. Here we go. And we said that in the population our relationship is described by this alpha and beta but we don't know it what we do get uh, is this A and B which is based on sample information and these are estimates for alpha and beta only that means we still have an inference issue okay we want to be able to use our sample information to know something to learn something about the population. So how do we go from sample to population? It's inference. And you know for inference we will never be able to make statements with certainty. The technique how what the technique we learn to link the two is what we call hypothesis testing. So hypothesis we always make about unknown coefficients. So here for instance about alpha or beta. Let's make it about beta and it's usually the beta that is sort of more interesting. Let's make a hypothesis and in fact I'm going to use a different hypothesis here than the one in the lecture just to give you some variety. And we talked about interpreting actually let me before we do that so we'll make a hypothesis about the beta. Before we do this, to form a reasonable hypothesis, we want to quickly review how we interpret this value. So where was our, here we got a value of B. Our estimate for beta was 40 approximately. What does that mean? It means that if we were in a position to increase the size of our house, Okay. If this guy here, SI, could be increased by one unit, then we would expect our house price to increase by 40.13764. Okay, so the interpretation here is this is the expected increase in price. So that is the dependent variable. If the house size, that is the explanatory variable, increased by one unit, by one unit. And unit here means square foot. Okay, you can see that from our data we said area that was um, our variable and it is square footage of house. Okay, so one unit is one square foot. So if we increase the house size by one square foot we would expect the house price to increase by 40. Let's go back to our hypothesis. Let's say someone said that all right this is sample information so I'm not 100% sure that that true beta is actually 40. Let's say I'm considering extending my house so that it increases in value but for this to be worthwhile I want let me just make a little statement okay so for the extension to be worthwhile, beta, that unknown coefficient, 
would have to be 35. Okay, a person has calculated how much does it cost to, to do an extension and says, okay, every additional square foot has to be worth more than 35 dollars. So now let's do a hypothesis testing on this. Where does that go? Remember, the equal sign always has to be in the null hypothesis. That means that larger will go into the alternative hypothesis and here we really are testing therefore in the null hypothesis that beta is smaller or equal to 35. Okay, remember equal sign always has to go to the null hypothesis. So that's our first step. Second step, we have to set alpha. Without much thinking here, I'll set it to 5%. Okay, the probability of rejecting a correct null hypothesis. Now we need the test stat. And I told you that what we use is a t-test. And the formula for the t-test here looks very similar to the t-test which we saw for testing for a population mean. So our estimated value, b, minus the hypothesized value, divided by the standard error of b. Okay. And we need to know how this is distributed. Okay, remember that is equivalent to saying is distributed as and it turns out that it is standard normally distributed there's a note of caution here I'll we'll say for large samples it's actually a, a heap of other assumptions but as I said uh, you can uh, learn all about this in your third year in my econometrics class if you choose to accept the challenge of course. All right now before we do calculations I also want the decision rule. It's always good to write this down before we do any calculations. Now we run almost out of space but that's all that's all we need. Okay the decision rule. Let me just draw a little graph. I'll draw it up here. We know the test statistic is normally distributed. So here's our little normal distribution. Okay. So we need to think what type of evidence would make us reject the null hypothesis. In favor of the alternative, clearly a type of evidence that would make us believe that the beta is indeed larger than 35 would be estimates for beta, therefore Bs, that are clearly larger than 35. So we're really thinking of rejecting the null hypothesis if our B gets sufficiently large. Now, if B gets sufficiently large, first we need to know, so the question is now if B gets sufficiently large, what happens to our test statistic. In our test statistic that beta here will be that value from the null hypothesis. Okay so if our b gets much larger than 35 that means here our numerator will grow large and then divided by a standard error. We don't know yet where that comes from or if you were at the lecture of course you know. So we are looking to reject the null hypothesis for large values of the t-test. So somehow our decision rule is going to look like this, that we're going to reject h naught if our t-test, here we have our t-test, is larger than a certain value and we do not reject H0 if our t-test is smaller than this little value. And we only have one value here because we have a one-sided test. Okay, In the lecture notes we have a two-sided test. So the question is where does this value come from? Okay, This value we call that also the critical value. Well, for this we now need to use the information about our alpha. Okay, 
and basically we want to find that value from the standard normal distribution that cuts off our alpha probability in the right hand tail of that distribution. How do we find that? Well for this you need the normal table. Okay, in the exam you would have been given this table. Remember what we get in this table here is in the center these numbers tell us the probability up to a certain and therefore the area underneath the normal distribution up to a certain value. So for instance if we were to be looking at negative 0.71 the area underneath the curve up to that value would be approximately 24% so negative 0.71 so negative 0.71 the area in here up to here would be about 24% but this is not what we are interested in so let me just get rid of this stuff again so the question is now basically what value cuts off 5% on the right now if we want 5% in here, 0.05, how much area do we need in here? Well, 0.95, because we know underneath the entire normal distribution is an area of 1. So we want to find 0.95 in the table and then read off which value cuts this off. So 0.95, we have to go further down. Here we get in the right region. Nine, uh, so up here, nine four nine five nine. F so, the value is somewhere in between here. So the question is, what value is that? One point six, and if we go to the top of the column, it's between one point six four and one point six five. So let's, because it seems to be somewhere right in the middle, so we use the middle value, one point six four five. So this value here. turns out to be 1.645. So that means the decision rule is reject H0 if the t-test is larger than 1.645. So the next step we have to do is the calculation. calculations. Okay, so we need to calculate that t-test and compare it to 1.645. We have the so t-test. We have the b that was 40 point... Oh, I forgot how much exactly it was. Let me scroll up to find it. 40.13764 so 40.13764 minus the beta, that is 35, minus 35, divided by SEB. Now, standard error of beta, as we discussed in the lecture, that recognizes that our B is a random variable, because it depends on our sample. Where do we get it from? Now, to get this, we usually get that from Excel, or if you use a different software, or I give the value to you in, in the exam. So now we need to quickly learn how to use Excel to run regressions in an easy manner. So here we have our spreadsheet. What you need is in data, there's an option data analysis. If you haven't got that, if you can't see data analysis, that means you have to go to uh, file and then, uh, no, sorry, to options and in options is an add-ins option and here you can um, you can add an extra analysis tool and what you need is the analysis tool pack okay if you don't have it up here it will appear in this little list in the inactive applications and you double click on it and just follow whatever Excel asks you to do I have it already once you have it it appears here 
has all sorts of goodies in here and amongst it regression. In regression you need to say, oh, let me delete that, I did that before. So you first see this one. What you need to say is you need to tell Excel what your Y range is, Y for dependent variable, and what your X range is. So let me tell Excel where the Y variable is. It's in column H. Particularly, it's from H2 to H322. And where's your X variable? Well, that turns out to be in column J. So in column J to column J322. All right. And then you can leave everything as it is. Actually, there are a few options. You can try a little bit around. Um, and output options we we'll put it on a new worksheet you don't give it a name and you click OK and what you get is the output which you also have on the lecture slides okay here are your A and your B and here are the standard errors let me just make this, these lines a little bit larger these are the standard errors okay and what we needed is the standard error to B now this is we just label that differently. That was A and that was B. Okay, A it said constant. I'll undo it again. Constant or intercept, and that is the coefficient to the x variable or what we call the slope coefficient. Now the SEB was 2.66. So let us go back here. The SEB was 2.66. So we get that from Excel. So now we need to calculate this. Let me bring up my little fancy calculator. 40.13769 minus 35. It's 5.13769 and then divided by 2.66. We get is 1.9315. Nine three one five, and that lets us go to step number five, which is the decision reject H naught as one point nine three one five is indeed larger than one point six four five. So what have we concluded? Indeed, it appears as this hypothesis is the one to go for. It appears as if the slope is larger than 35 and that means the extension may be worthwhile for this particular case okay so this is how we do hypothesis testing for beta it's the same for alpha it's usually more interesting on the beta in the lecture notes we did a hypothesis test on the null hypothesis beta equals to naught and the alternative beta is unequal to naught Okay, and we argued that beta equal to naught meant that the particular explanatory variable used has no impact on the dependent variable. Now, where this becomes particularly important, it wasn't very interesting in our example because it was a no-brainer that house size is related to house price. But that becomes particularly important when you do a multiple regression. Multiple regression, remember, you have more than one explanatory variable. So what we're now going to do, why we don't really do that is because we can't represent that graphically. So we, we can really only use our regression tool for this. Let's go back to the data. Let's say, let's see what other data we have here. Let's just think about which other variables could be influential for the for the price. For instance, the age. Okay, is there any relationship to the age of the house. So what we're going to do, and let's see, is there perhaps another one? Uh, we have um, number of bathrooms. Why don't we do use that? We use number of bathrooms, age, and the size as our three explanatory variables. Now I'll just show you very quickly how to how to do that. We call up our regression tool again. This is not relevant for the exam, for those who are worried about these sorts of things. The 
dependent variable is exactly the same thing. Okay, we are still trying to explain the price of the house. But now we are concerned about the age, the area, and the number of baths bathrooms. Okay, so we have three variables here. Unfortunately, if you do it like this, just um, highlight the columns. So you can see here column B, column J, and column, column L. If you click OK, it will complain regression input must be a con uh, contiguous reference. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what that word means. What it complains about is that these are sort of, you know, all over the place. So it's easiest to just, before you do that, rearrange your data in the, in the following way. What all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that column age somewhere back here. And I'm going to copy the column area back here and the column bathrooms back here. So now I can then just highlight these three columns and somehow Excel likes that better. Here we go. Regression. So we have our dependent variable still in H, but the explanatory variables are now here. Okay, in these three columns from U2 to W322. Now I click OK. And here we go. And now you can see the following. We have two extra lines here. Before we had two lines and in particular we had the intercept and we had our variable size. Now you can see in our case now size is the is actually the second variable here. So the coefficient which represents our size variable is now this guy. Actually, let me just replace this. The first variable was age, the second was size, and the third was number of bathrooms. So you can see by including these two extra variables actually our coefficient for the size has changed. Now it appears as if an extra square foot is only worth about thirty and a half dollars. Oh that's worrying for our chap who wants to do the extension. And now these two other variables, okay, we have age and we have number of bathrooms. You can see, importantly, age is negative, okay. So what does that mean? That means as the age of the house increases by one, by one year, what happens to the value of the house or the price of the house? It decreases. That, that means, on average, older houses are cheaper than newer houses. Okay, If everything else is the same, older houses are cheaper than newer houses. What about bathrooms? A positive coefficient here, so extra bathrooms. One extra bathroom adds about $12,000 to the value of the house. That's not too bad. Okay, One extra bathroom adds about $12,000 to the house. So now here you could again ask the question, is any of these coefficients equal to zero? And if it was, that would mean, for instance, if that coefficient, the, the true but unknown coefficient to bathrooms was equal to zero, that means the number of bathrooms doesn't really matter. And you could perform a hypothesis test. Here you have your B, here you have your standard error, and you can perform a t-test. Okay, So that's how we can use multiple regression. And you see, technically, to do it, it's really not more difficult than a simple regression, apart from the fact that it's usually easiest to arrange your variables such that they're next to each other if you want to use them. So I think really this was all I wanted to, uh, to say here. Happy regressing.